What's up dogs? So in this video we're going to look at the case for physicalism. Physicalism is the metaphysical view according to which everything that exists is physical. Uh, currently physicalism is the consensus among philosophers, but why is this? What are the arguments in favour of physicalism? That's what we'll be looking at today. First of all, just a quick advert. Uh, if you like my channel, uh, please consider supporting me either on Patreon or just a uh, one-off donation on PayPal. Any any support you can give really helps. Um, I also offer private tutoring. You can email me for more on that. And I have a Discord. Uh, so if you want to talk about any of these topics, join the Discord. Okay then. So, the first question, of course, is, well, what exactly is physicalism. Uh, unfortunately, there are as many characterizations of physicalism as there are physicalists. It would, uh, you know, take a whole video to outline the different versions of physicalism. And I do, in fact, have a video which I just uploaded a few days ago where I talk about some of the problems uh, with defining physicalism. I will link that in the comments. Um, but the basic idea is that fundamentally all things are physical uh, or there is only one kind of property physical properties. All things are dependent on the physical. So think about the fundamental entities and forces described by physics, you know, maybe fermions and bosons, maybe strings, whatever. The thought is that all things are dependent on or constituted out of these fundamental physical things. So if you fix the nature and distribution of fermions and bosons, you fix everything else. Uh, a common way to put this is to say that everything supervenes on the physical. To say that A supervenes on B is to say that there cannot be a change in A properties without a change in B properties. So consider, for instance, this image of Frank Zappa. The shapes in the image supervene on the colours of the pixels and the like arrangement of colours on, uh, on the level of the pixels. So you can't change the shapes of the image. Um, you know, I wouldn't be able to like give Frank Zappa here a beard uh, without changing the colours of the pixels. So we say that this, you know, the, the, the sort of higher level properties of this image supervene on the, uh, the arrangement of the pixels. So similarly then, the physicalist will say that you can't change any property without changing the physical properties, the distribution of fermions and bosons. Okay then, so with that said, why believe physicalism? What are the arguments for it? Um, well, uh, I will outline uh, four arguments here that seem to motivate uh, at least some physicalists. Um, interestingly, actually, although physicalism is, is the dominant view in philosophy, there aren't, um, I mean, there aren't really a whole lot of arguments in favour of it. Uh, I mean, that's probably just the nature of philosophy. You know, it's it's more common to focus on on attacking positions and defending your position from attacks than it is on developing positive arguments for a position. But, you know, I'm, I'm going to do my best to, to you know, present uh, the case for physicalism. So first of all, we have the explanatory argument. This is discussed, for instance, by William Seeger in the article, Why Physicalism? So physicalism, Seeger suggests, has unparalleled explanatory power. Almost all of the observable world can now be explained in physicalist terms, where previous metaphysical projects have failed. So, as Seeger puts it, it is an undeniable fact that vast swathes of the world have fallen under the explanatory project of physicalism. We now possess the outlines, and in many areas far more than outlines, of a truly grand metaphysical edifice, which encompasses the entire spatial extent and history of the observable universe. So, you know, just look at the, uh, the, the development of science over the last few centuries, right? We now have a detailed understanding of the behaviour of fundamental particles and the constraints imposed by physical laws. We understand in detail the reductive relations between different domains. So, you know, we can explain biological phenomena in terms of, like, chemistry, you know, in terms of, like, molecules. Um, we can explain the chemical phenomena in terms of physics. So we've built this remarkably systematic picture of the world where the behaviour of objects is understood in terms of the basic physical constituents and laws that govern them. Macroscopic phenomena can often be, you know, can often be explained by breaking things down into their component parts and those parts can be explained by breaking them down into their component parts and so on until we reach the fundamental particles. So we can call this the, uh, the reductive project. Um, explaining things by breaking them down, by reducing them. Um, 
Now, of course, there have sometimes seemed to be obstacles to this project, uh, but many of those obstacles have been overcome. So it was once believed that life could not be understood in terms of materialistic chemical processes. Many biologists in the 1800s um, proposed that there must be some sort of uh, non-physical vital principle that accounts for the transition from chemical substances to genuinely organic processes. But this turned out to be incorrect. With the development of biochemistry, uh, experimental work demonstrating the synthesis of organic compounds such as urea from inorganic compounds, with the explanation of the origin of species and Darwinian evolution and so on, we eventually came to see life as just another physical process. So the claim is then that physicalism is far more successful than any other metaphysical view and the best explanation for this remarkable success is that physicalism is true. So that's the argument. Now the thing to notice with this argument is that the the data that we're appealing to here is the success of science, in particular the success of a kind of reductive scientific project where we you know we show how higher level things ultimately depend on fundamental particles and forces and the, you know the claim is that the success of this project supports belief in physicalism and the big question then is is it legitimate to take the success of science as the success of physicalism specifically um i mean an obvious problem here is well you know, science is a way of investigating the world. It's a collection of empirical theories, instruments, methodologies, and so on. Um, you know, and, and whereas physicalism is a metaphysical thesis, uh, it's, not, it's not actually at all obvious that physicalism is entailed by or assumed by science. Um, it's not really clear that science can decide between alternative metaphysical frameworks, even in principle. So basically there's a kind of underdetermination problem here. Um, so any set of data will, in principle, be compatible with a variety of different theories. This is a very general problem in philosophy of science. Um, I have a couple of videos on underdetermination, which I can, again, link in the comments. Um, but but it's, a, it's particularly problematic with metaphysical theories, because metaphysical theories are often taken to be sort of non-empirical. Um, so consider, for instance, idealism, right? Idealism is the view that there exist only minds and ideas, minds and appearances. Now, it's often thought that idealism isn't really an empirical theory, it doesn't make any empirical predictions, and indeed any series of observations at all would be logically compatible with idealism. So that is, anything that you observe could just be a mental event. Uh, I mean, this is obvious if we think about, <clears throat> if we think about, for instance, solipsism. So uh, if you accept at least the logical possibility of solipsism, right, and, and that seems, I mean, most people do, so it seems at least logically possible that there is only your mind and everything is just a hallucination, right? It's just like your mind and appearances to your mind. So, I mean, obviously this is a form of idealism that not many people would want to accept, but the point is it seems at least logically possible that, yeah, I mean, maybe maybe it's all just a hallucination. Nothing, um, and, and like, like you, you, you never have access to any other world or to any other person, it's just your mind. Now, the, the thought is nothing you have ever observed or ever could observe could rule out this hypothesis with logical certainty. And this is just to say that all observations are compatible with this hypothesis. But in that case, it's not clear how science, which, you know, I mean, science seems to proceed by, you know, science decides between theories on the basis of observation, right? You know, we have a, we have a theory, we derive a prediction, we make an observation to see whether that prediction is uh, confirmed or disconfirmed. I mean, so science uses observation to, as the sort of tool to decide between theories. So it's not clear how science could say anything about physicalism or idealism one way or the other. If it's the case that idealism is indeed compatible with any series of observations. So we might say, OK, um, you know, maybe this is a bit too quick. Uh, so the physicalist might grant that both physicalism and idealism are logically compatible with any particular series of observations. But still, the physicalist might say, well, you know, there's, there's a kind of explanatory asymmetry between these theories. So we have this um, 
this puzzling phenomenon, right? The puzzling phenomenon is the success of the explanatory project, is the success of the reductive project. So the reductive project that I described earlier, you know, we explain things by breaking them down into their more fundamental constituents. That's been a remarkably successful project. And the question is, why? Right? Why has the reductive project been so successful? Well, the success of this project is entirely to be expected on physicalism. Physicalism tells us that the world is constituted out of certain basic things, fundamental particles, fundamental forces. Uh, the nature of these fundamental uh, uh, physical things fixes the nature of everything. So from that point of view, it makes sense that, you know, if you want to understand how anything works, you should proceed by breaking it down into its constituent parts. So on physicalism, the success of the reductive project is entirely to be expected. And notice that actually in practice, um, any cases where the reductive project seems to run into trouble, such as with the difficulties reducing consciousness to brain states, these cases are often framed as challenges to physicalism. Um, so, so insofar as the reductive project is successful, like physicalism explains this, it explains why. It's a good explanation for the success of the reductive project. By contrast, there's no particular reason to expect this kind of success on idealism. So yes, in principle, idealism is compatible with the reductive project, with a successful reductive project. But there's still a puzzle about why the world happens to be set up in such a way that allows this project to work. The most that idealists can say is that their view does not rule out that the reductive project will be successful. But this is because idealism doesn't rule out that any given project will be successful. For all idealism says, the reductive project could have failed and, you know, voodoo or astrology or faith healing or forming beliefs by flipping coins could have been successful instead. So both theories are logically compatible with the set of observations that we have made, but physicalism still provides a better explanation. That's the idea. So, you know, the thought is, okay, there's this explanatory asymmetry. I mean, the obvious concern with this is that it's not actually obvious that physicalism rules out any other kind of project either. So, you know, just as, just as idealism is compatible with any series of observations, so the same we, we might say is, is true for, um, for physicalism. Um, like, even if it's the case that everything is composed of fundamental particles, it, I mean, it might still turn out that, you know, it wouldn't follow from that alone that the best method for us to learn about things is through reductive analysis. Um, and there could be lots of reasons for that. You know, it could be that um, uh, maybe uh, trying to understand things by breaking them down into their components just like outstrips. It's just far too complex, right? Maybe the world is just far, the world could have been far too complex to allow that to work. Um, but like, so if we think about you know, these sorts of alternatives to the reductive project, like <laughs> voodoo, astrology, faith healing, forming beliefs by flipping coins. There's a way the world could have been set up so that everything is composed of fundamental particles, but um, those sorts of methods, you know, yielded good results for some reason. You know, I mean, it doesn't seem like, it certainly doesn't seem like there's anything logically contradictory in that. So uh, the idealist might say, well, you know, actually, physicalism, um, it, so, okay, physicalism is also just going to be compatible. It doesn't rule out these projects either. So, um, you know, we're, there isn't really an explanatory asymmetry here. Um, actually, maybe another way to see this is to, is to again, think about like a, a sort of, um, well, think about something like a brain in a vat sort of view, right? So scientists can stimulate your brain to produce any given series of experiences, but that would be occurring in a physical world. The brain is physical, the vat is physical, uh, but but even so, you, you get the same experiences that you've had, um, you know, in this world. Um, okay, so that was the explanatory argument. A second argument in favour of physicalism, one of the most popular arguments, is the causal closure argument. So this begins with the claim that the physical world is causally closed. All physical events have physical causes that are sufficient to bring about the physical event. Given some physical event, we can always find a sufficient explanation of it in terms of purely physical causes. So anything that has physical effects must itself be physical. There's basically no room for non-physical things to influence the physical world. And then the claim will be that whatever things are 
cited as being purportedly non-physical, these things have physical effects, from which it follows that the purportedly non-physical thing is in fact physical. Uh, this argument is usually presented in the context of philosophy of mind, so it's usually framed in terms of mental events, and so that's how I'm going to frame it here. Um, so a, a standard um, outline of this argument would be premise one, all physical effects have sufficient physical causes. Premise two, all mental events have physical effects. Premise three, the physical effects of mental events are not overdetermined. So conclusion, mental events are identical with physical events. Premise one is a statement of the causal closure of the physical. In support of premise two, we can point out that mental events you know, play various causal roles. Uh, it seems that my mental states guide my behaviour. My mental states cause particular patterns of behaviour, and that, of course, manifests in my physical body. So the mental events have physical effects. Premise three um, I, I, is, is an interesting one. Premise three rules out the idea that the physical effects of mental events might have they both they might have both physical and mental causes. So premise three rules this out. It rules out overdetermination. So according to according to causal closure, any physical event has a sufficient physical cause. That the, the physical cause is sufficient to bring about the physical event. But we might think, well, couldn't there be multiple causes of an event where each is sufficient to bring it about? I mean, think about you know, a famous example here is like a firing squad where, you know, like nine, pe nine people shoot one person. Um, and it seems like each, you know, each bullet is causally sufficient to kill the one person. Um, but, you know, there are, there are multiple kind of causes there. So there's, there's causal overdetermination. Where, like each cause is fully sufficient to bring about the event. Um, but still, there are, there are multiple causes. So the thought is then, OK, we could have some physical event S1 that is fully sufficient to bring about physical event S2. But then there's also this mental event M1 that is also fully sufficient to bring about S2. So S2 is overdetermined. Uh, now, most philosophers have found this kind of widespread causal overdetermination implausible. Um, obviously, premise three rules this out. Exactly what's wrong with causal overdetermination is a bit of a tricky question. Um, one worry about causal overdetermination, at least in this context, is that it would seem to involve a kind of remarkable coincidence. So let's suppose that physical event S1 and mental event M1 are both fully sufficient to bring about physical event S2. Well, okay, so we kind of have this puzzle here because for every action a person takes, there are going to be these two completely independent causal processes, two causal processes involving completely different kind of, kinds of things that just so happen to converge in producing the same effect. So particular types of physical event reliably cause these other types of physical event, but these physical events are also reliably caused by particular types of mental events, even though the physical and mental causes are completely different. Um, so causal overdetermination seems to involve this kind of weird sort of global coincidence um, where you have like physical and mental events that just so happen to align in, in terms of what they cause. Um, so anyway, if there is no causal overdetermination of this kind, and if all physical events have sufficient physical causes, then this entails that no, no physical effect has a non-physical cause. So any mental cause of behaviour must be a physical cause. Okay, let's consider some objections. Well, first of all, one question we could ask is, well, why should we accept that anything has physical effects? Um, I mean, the way that this causal closure argument usually proceeds is by considering the connection between a purportedly non-physical event and a purportedly physical event. So, for example, I desire to eat an apple. So my desire to eat an apple is a mental event, and then this causes my body to move in particular ways. It causes me to pick up an apple, and that's a physical event. The body is physical, the apple is physical. But, as we have mentioned previously, all our, all our observations are underdetermined by multiple metaphys metaphysical theories. Why is the raising of an arm a physical event? Why is an apple a physical thing? That's certainly not how an idealist or phenomenalist or some neutral monists will view the situation. So suppose we say with Berkeley that there just are no physical objects. There are only minds and ideas. The apple is not a mind-independent object. It's composed of 
sets of mental impressions, certain visual and tactile impressions that exhibit particular regularities and are connected in certain ways with other impressions. So as Barclay puts it, he says, by sight I have the ideas of light and colours with their several degrees and variations. By touch I perceive, for example, hard and soft, heat and cold, motion and resistance. Smelling furnishes me with odours, the taste, the palate with tastes, and hearing conveys sounds to the mind in all their variety of tone and composition. And as several of these are observed to accompany each other, they come to be marked by one name and to be reputed as one thing. Thus, for example, a certain colour, taste, smell, figure and consistence have been observed to go together, are accounted one distinct thing signified by the name apple. The point here, I suppose, is that, you know, what we're labelling an apple is, it, or what we actually have, you know, our evidence, the, the, or at least the immediate data we have access to, is just a collection of appearances. And there's multiple models for what these appearances might be. We could take it that the appearances are produced by a physical object, or we could take it that the appearances are ideas in the mind. I mean, think about it this way, right? Like, I might have a dream in which I form the desire to eat an apple, followed by the appearance of an arm raising an apple to my face. But in that case, we're not, we, we wouldn't usually say that the apple in the dream is a physical object. I mean, what I'm calling the apple in my dream, that's not a literal physical object. Um, in this case, there are just, there are two mental events, right? There's the desire to eat the apple and the appearance in the dream. Um, but then the same kind of view might be extended to, you know, perception in general, right? Like, so instead of taking it that ordinary perceptions are produced by mind-independent objects, we could say that they, that there are only these mental appearances. The causal closure argument only works if we already grant that there are physical events, but there are plenty of alternative metaphysical views that will not grant this. Okay, well, let's suppose we do grant this. Let's suppose we do accept that there are physical things. There are still further ways of resisting the closure argument. So a second option, um, and this again challenges the second premise, is to endorse epiphenomenalism, the view that mental events are caused by physical events, but mental events do not themselves cause anything. Uh, so mental events don't cause physical events. Mental events are causally on inert. <clears throat> According to the epiphenomenalist, um, the, the idea would be, I mean, so consider something like, for instance, the experience of fear. So the idea would be that there are certain patterns of neural impulses, which are physical events, and these cause a mental event. These cause a subjective experience of fear. These patterns of neural impulses also cause behavior, such as fleeing or free freezing. And that's another physical event. So you have the physical event of neural impulses. These cause the experience of fear, which is a mental event, and they also cause physical behavior. But there is never any causal link from the mental to the physical. Um, and of course, the same story could be told for any other purportedly non-physical thing. Um, so you have a physical event which causes a non-physical event, and the physical event also causes a physical event. And there's this correlation, there's a correlation between the mental event and the physical event, but that's all there is. For the epiphenomenalist, our sense that mental events cause behaviour is just an illusion. It's you know, analogous to when we might might watch an animated cartoon on YouTube, right? Like you you see one one moving ball strike a second ball, you see the second ball move. So you might be inclined to say, oh, the first ball causes the second ball to move, but uh, we know that's not actually true. <laughs> I mean, there's there aren't in fact there aren't even any balls in this case, but there's certainly no causal connection between you know the one circular shape and the other circular shape. There's just these changing patterns of pixels um, and the like the the causality is, I mean, there's, there's, I suppose, events going on in your computer or whatever. Um, but the idea that there's this like causal connection where one ball causes another ball to move, that's just an illusion. Um, and so similarly, this sense that mental events cause behavior for the epiphenomenalist, that's a kind of illusion. Uh, okay, so you could endorse that sort of view. And on this kind of view, um, there are physical things, but, uh, but premise two, which um, which says that all mental events have physical effects, the, the idealist denies uh, the uh, epiphenomenalist denies that. Okay, so another objection to the causal closure argument is that there may be domains of reality that are simply non-causal. There may be things that are neither caused to exist nor have any causal effects. 
Um, it's, it's worth noting, as I mentioned, that the causal closure argument for physicalism is most commonly found in philosophy of mind. And I think that's probably because it's just a standardly assumed, it's like a common sense assumption that mental events cause behaviour, that there's causal interaction between mind and body. But now think about, for instance, mathematical objects and moral values. Well, many philosophers hold that the mathematical objects and moral properties are abstract, non-spatiotemporal. They have no causal powers. Nothing causes them to exist, and in turn, they cannot exert any causal influence on anything. So mathematical Platonists and moral non-naturalists would, uh, would endorse this kind of view, right? They would take, they would take it that, that mathematical objects and moral properties are real, right? They're part of reality, but they're non-causal. Um, so the causal closure argument isn't going to provide any reason at all for taking these things to be physical. Um, now, I mean, obviously, conceiving of mathematical objects and moral values in this way is extremely controversial. Um, the physicalist could appeal to independent arguments against these views. But, you know, I mean, the, the point is, is like this, again, like if, if you uh, endorse uh, the idea that there are these non-causal domains, then um, the causal closure argument specifically isn't going to have any force. Um, okay, a final possible response to the causal closure argument is to uh, attack the assumptions it makes about the nature of causality. Um, so, w what is causality? Uh, this remains a, a viciously difficult question. Um, but without a clear understanding of what causality is, it's not clear why we should accept any of the premises of the causal closure argument. Um, like, so, I mean, all of these premises rest on assumptions about how causality works. You know, it's like every physical event has a sufficient physical cause. There's no causal overdetermination, etc. Um, but it, it turns out that, like, okay, causality, this concept causality, is actually highly problematic. There's a great deal of debate about how to understand what causality is. Um, in fact, th there may be a, a special problem here for physicalists, because physicalists take it that fundamental physics describes the nature and structure of reality. But at least some philosophers have argued that physics actually undermines causality, or it, it undermines causality as it's commonly understood. Um, so from that point of view, the causal closure argument looks outright self-undermining. Um, you know, physicalists appeal to facts about causality to establish physicalism, but then by their own worldview, they ought to reject causality, or at least they ought to take causality as being merely a sort of useful idealization. Um, now, it would take a whole video to explore these sort of skeptical views of causality. An early expression is found in Bertrand Russell's article on the notion of a cause, more recently, um, John Norton has an article called Causation as Folk Science. Um, if you look at the description, I'll, I'll give the details of those. Um, but um, let's, I'll, I'll give a, a very simple argument. This is, this is presented in Russell's article. So, <clears throat> so the thought is, scientists do not aim to give sort of rough qualitative generalizations. They aim to quantify events precisely. Um, so an object falling at you know, 9.5 meters per second, that's a different event from an object falling at 9.8 meters per second. And indeed, this difference could make, that could make the difference between confirmation of a prediction or the refutation of it. So it's like if you think about something like general relativity's prediction of light bending around the sun, general relativity didn't just say, oh, there's going to be light bending around the sun. Um, it gave a very precise prediction about what the degree of light bending would be. And if that prediction had been off, that would have been a, a big problem for the theory. Um, so, okay, now suppose we say something like A causes B. So th th the problem here is that once event A has been described in enough detail that, first of all, right, we, we need to be able to quantify B precisely. So we're not just saying that, like, A, event A causes the stone to fall. We need to say event A causes the stone to fall at a particular speed, on a particular tra trajectory, and we need to specify that precisely. So we need to describe A in enough detail that we can, on the basis of A, give a precisely quantified prediction. And then secondly, we need to actually be able to say that B will occur, that you know nothing in the environment will intervene so as to prevent B from occurring. 
but the, the, the trouble is that once we've described A in enough detail that these two conditions are met, then event A will have such a complex description that it will be extremely unlikely that this event ever recurs. So, you know, like if you think about describing the cause of a falling stone, right, A specifies, you know, the environment, uh, B describes the stone's fall. Um, well, the speed of the fall is going to depend on the shape of the object, the density of the air, the force of gravity, and so on. And, and like all of that has to be packed in to the description of A. And I mean, once you've packed that much information into the description of A, it's going to occur very, very rarely, if ever. Um, so we're essentially no longer, go there's no long longer going to be any kind of regular connection between type A events and type B events. So we're not going to have any sort of causal generalization that, you know, type A events cause type B events. So that's one of the, um, that's a very brief outline of one of the kind of worries uh, that, that Russell raises. One of the reasons to think that talk of causality is maybe an idealization. Um, uh, okay, then. So a third argument for physicalism appeals to simplicity. Uh, and this is most famously expressed in Occam's Razor. Do not multiply entities beyond necessity. Well, according to physicalists, there's only one fundamental kind of property, namely physical properties. Physicalism aims to explain everything in terms of physical properties. And this makes it a very simple theory, um, at least in terms of what it postulates as the fundamental constituents of the world. Um, and of course, the physicalist will say, well, there's no need to postulate non-physical things because perfectly adequate explanations of phenomena are available from physics and other natural sciences. So, I mean, in some ways, the point here is similar to the causal closure argument, right? Like all physical phenomena have sufficient physical explanations, but our only reliable access to the world is via physical phenomena. You know, objects and properties impinging on our senses in various ways. If we can explain our sensory observations, we've explained everything we need to explain, and these explanations can be given in fully physical terms. Um, so, do not multiply entities beyond necessity. We only need... We only need physical things. Um, so one sort of point to make about the parsimony argument is that, okay, physicalism postulates only one kind of thing. But prima facie, there are alternative metaphysical schemes that are equally parsimonious, at least in terms of their ontological commitments. Physicalism is ontologically simple because it is a form of monism. So it posits just one fundamental kind of thing. But idealism and neutral monism are also forms of monism. You know, a physicalist will say everything is physical. The idealist says everything is mental. The neutral monist says there's some single type of property that underlies both mind and matter. Um, now, all of these are more ontologically parsimonious than, say, substance dualism, but there's no clear victory for physicalism specifically, uh, at least in terms of, you know, ontological simplicity. Another response is to question whether simplicity is truth tracking. No doubt there is some sense in which we prefer our models and theories to be simple, but can we conclude from this that the world itself is simple? Perhaps simplicity is merely a pragmatic virtue. You know, we prefer simpler theories because such theories are easier to work with. Indeed, we might point out that from the physicalist's own point of view, the picture of the world that has been emerging is one of increasing complexity. So in the early 20th century, it was thought that all material objects consisted of atoms and uh, all atoms could be broken down into protons and electrons, which were understood in terms of electromagnetic forces. With later developments, scientists were forced to postulate neutrons within atoms. They were forced to postulate weird particles like neutrinos and muons new forces with the strong and weak nuclear forces. And then it turns out that some of these particles behave in weirdly complex ways. For instance, neutrinos oscillate uh, randomly between different neutrino flavors. So we have electron, muon, and tau neutrinos. Um, and now today, the standard model in particle physics involves 19 different free parameters that are unrelated. Here's the list from Wikipedia. Um, so... I mean, it's not, it's not at all clear that like the standard model provides a simple picture of reality. Uh, now, of course, the physicalist will say, well, 
fundamentally, they're, there are only physical things. So if we take physics as the guide, then fundamentally there are only fermions and bosons. But, I mean, okay, you can put it that way, but that just seems to kind of disguise um, a great deal of complexity that is actually present in the theory. Um, because, yeah, so one way you could put it is to say, well, you know, there's just fermions and bosons. Or you could say, well, it's just physical things. Another way you could put it is to say there's this model that has 19 different free parameters. Eh, that doesn't sound quite so simple. Um, so we might then, so yeah, I mean, so you might say, well, look, um, there's just no particular reason to assume that, like, the world itself is simple. Maybe simplicity is a kind of, it's, it's, pra it's like pragmatic. It has pragmatic utility. Um, it's something that we value because we find it easier to work with simple theories for obvious reasons. Um, okay, so um, another response to the simplicity argument is to say, well, there are a number of arguments that attempt to show that physicalism does not and um, cannot adequately explain certain phenomena. For example, there are various arguments that physicalism in principle cannot explain consciousness. Think about, you know, the hard problem of consciousness, um, Mary's room or the philosophical zombie argument. These sorts of arguments are designed to show that consciousness is not going to be uh, understood in physicalist terms. So the appeal to simplicity simply doesn't work, right? Rules like Occam's razor tell us we ought not to multiply entities beyond necessity. But it's perfectly legitimate, even from the point of view of Occam's razor, to multiply entities when those entities are doing explanatory work. And the anti-physicalist may say, we need non-physical properties to do explanatory work. Um, so actually, simplicity doesn't weigh in favour of physicalism. Now, of course, the physicalist will object that these arguments are unsuccessful. Um, but the point is that, notice what's happened. So that what, what's happened is that we've just shifted the question to these sort of arguments for and against physicalist accounts of particular phenomena. You know, sim so this notion of simplicity isn't really playing any role anymore. The anti-physicalist says, here's a phenomenon that cannot be accounted for in physicalist terms. The physicalist says, she can account for it. Um, now, the question then is just, well, can that phenomenon be accounted for in physicalist terms? Um, if, if so, then, okay, fine, maybe you can go on with physicalism. If not, uh, then it it looks like even if you accept Occam's razor, you're going to be postulating some sort of non-physical entity to uh, to account for that. Um, so you know, simplicity isn't really um, isn't really playing a role anymore in in evaluating the physicalist versus anti-physicalist theory. Okay, then a final argument is the argument from methodological naturalism. So this argument says, first of all, that metaphysical commitments ought to be guided by the methods and results of natural science. And the usual assumption here is that philosophy is not distinct from science, but is continuous with it. Now, I mean, obviously, there are differences between philosophy and science. But these are differences in degree rather than kind. So it's like, yeah, philosophy tends to ask more general questions about the world, or maybe it's concerned with more conceptual matters. It, you know, it doesn't, it, it's like philosophers tend to do, you know, thought experiments rather than actual experiments. But, but, you know, none of this is really outside the domain of science, right? So maybe philosophy is more general, maybe it has a more uh, conceptual focus. Um, but, you know, this is just a difference in degree, it's not a difference in kind. And moreover, the argument might go, science is our only reliable mechanism for finding out about the natural world. If philosophers want to understand how the world works, they'd better make sure that their theories are compatible with science. And then the claim, of course, will be that science favours physicalism. The metaphysics of science is physicalist, so we should be physicalist. Now, in fact, there are two ways we might understand this argument. So we could frame this argument in terms of the content of science, and th the argument might look something like this. Premise one, we ought to believe only in whatever is indispensable to our best scientific theories. Premise two, our best scientific theories postulate only physical things, There's nothing non-physical postulated in the sciences. Premise, and then so conclusion, we ought to believe only in physical things. We ought to be physicalists. Now we've already seen one way an anti-physicalist might respond to this argument. They could reject the second premise. They could say that scientific theories do not in themselves 
commit to physicalism or to any other specific metaphysical theory. Uh, additionally, of course, the anti-physicalist could attack the first premise. Even if our best scientific theories are physicalist, we might argue that it is reasonable to believe in things beyond what is postulated in such theories. Maybe philosophical argument can provide good reason to believe in things. I mean, look at it this way. Suppose that a philosophical argument is presented for the conclusion that consciousness cannot be explained in purely physical terms. So maybe it's, you know, Mary's room or the zombie argument. What does it matter that this argument is not a product of the sciences? I mean, it seems like the relevant questions here are simply, first of all, is there some, like, are the premises true, right? Uh, and then secondly, is the, is the inference form valid? Because, it, I mean, okay, if the premises are true, and if the inference form is valid, if there's no error in the inferential structure, then it looks like we're committed to the conclusion, regardless of whether or not the argument counts as, you know, scientific. So the argument isn't a product of science, right? This is just, you know, philosophers sitting on armchairs, they presented an argument. Um, if, you're, if you're not denying the premises and you're not saying that the inference form is invalid, then the anti-physicalist will say, well, you know, you're committed to the conclusion. Um, like, doesn't, doesn't matter whether or not it comes from science, right? Um, so... Uh, uh, yeah, so this is one way of, of I suppose, resisting the uh, the methodological naturalists. You might say, well, no, there are there may be other reasons to um, believe in things beyond what is indispensable to our best scientific theories. So an alternative way of framing the methodological naturalist argument is to appeal to the methods of science. So this argument would go like this: premise one, metaphysicians ought to use the same criteria of theory choice as are used in the sciences. Premise two, applying scientific criteria of theory choice to metaphysical theories favours physicalism. So conclusion, we ought to believe physicalism. Um, we ought to believe physicalism. So what exactly are the criteria of theory choice in science? Well, one obvious problem with this kind of argument is that it seems that a central part of scientific methodology is that we derive predictions from theories and then test those predictions against observation. A good scientific theory rules out a large range of phenomena. For example, general relativity predicts a specific value for the degree of gravitational deflection of light by a large mass such as the sun. If anything other than this value is observed, the prediction is disconfirmed and the theory must be modified. So the theory is incompatible with a huge range of possible observations. Um, you know, with, with many possible values for the bending of light by a large mass. So in science, okay, we derive these highly specific predictions and then test those predictions against observation. This does not seem to be how we proceed when doing metaphysics. Metaphysical theories don't make empirical predictions, or at least if they do make predictions, they're not the sort of precise predictions we find in science. So you know, it seems like this criterion of theory choice is not used in metaphysics. It's not clear how it could be used in metaphysics. Um, but, you know, empirical evidence is not the only criterion that's used in science to decide between theories. In addition, there are various non-empirical virtues or theoretical virtues. Now, there's a huge amount of debate about what exactly the non-empirical virtues are. Philosophers will usually list things like simplicity, explanatory power, uh, unifying power, non-ad hocness, internal coherence, coherence with background beliefs, and so on. So then the claim is, if we apply these non-empirical virtues to different metaphysical theories, physicalism wins. Um, of course, it, this now raises many of the same issues that we've already seen in the previous arguments. So the question now is, well, you know, does physicalism have greater explanatory power? Is physicalism more coherent with causal closure of the physical? Is physicalism simple? Um, so it's not obvious that the appeal to methodological naturalism interpreted in terms of applying the methods of science to metaphysics is in fact a, a sort of separate argument. It, it looks like this is just kind of raising the same issues that we've seen in the previous arguments. Right. Well, uh, that's the end of that video. Um, and... Um, those were some of the arguments that might be used to defend physicalism and um, some objections to those arguments. I hope you found that interesting and that 
is all for today. Goodbye, everybody.